All right, I'm Claudine Wong from KTVU in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm joined now by Jim Greenwood, who's the president and the CEO of the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Jim, thanks so much for joining us. Well, I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you. So you're coming to us from uh, Pennsylvania. And as we uh, talk about Biofarm and we talk about what has been happening in the world of vaccines and treatments for COVID-19, certainly everyone is rooting for scientists right now, but it is honestly, I think, hard to wrap our minds around, you know, where this research is now, where the industry is going, how much we can look at an effort and call it promising or not promising. How are you viewing what's happening in the industry right now? Well, what we're seeing is the, is the um, most unified, concerted, collaborative effort, in, I think, in history uh, to fight a disease. We have 250 companies right now, biotech companies, working on therapies, therapeutic drugs that will um, treat us if we do get infected, as well as vaccines, about 100 different uh, projects going on in vaccines. So um, I am optimistic that we'll get through this uh, and we'll be able to get back to normal. Um, the stages are going to be, um, first we have to, as you keep hearing all the time, we have mm -hmm. to get the diagnostic straight. We need to be able to know who has the antibodies and who hasn't, who's been infected and who hasn't. Because when the curve comes down and we go back out, right. um, most of us still will not have been effect, infected and we will get infected. Many of us will get the disease. What we want to do is be in a place where when that happens, we have antivirals that can be, that can be developed and they're in development now that will at least protect us from getting the worst syndrome, symptoms that put us in the hospitals. And that will enable, but those two things, the diagnostics and the therapeutics, will enable us to get back to the workplace and back to school and back to you know, socializing. Something that we uh, miss greatly these days. You know, I wanna get down to the nitty gritty of, of some of what you've talked about, but I should mention that, you know, you were a former member of what was called the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense and in 2015 created this national group blueprint to talk about biological threat. There's a, been a lot of discussion about the big picture, about how we have been handling this, whether we were prepared or not. But when you're talking about a blueprint of going forward, and even some who have described this search for a vaccine as kind of chaos, right? As, as there's all these great efforts going on, but there's not this generalized, you know, understanding of, okay, you guys do this, you, you folks in Oxford do that, we're going to do this over here. You know, every day we see a, a, something new popping up. Is that necessary? Or is when you're talking about all of the industry kind of working together, is it just kind of everyone, <laughs> everyone start running and then we'll organize later? All right. Actually, um, let me take those questions in, in reverse order. So we'll, okay. we'll, we'll talk to the, the, about the coordination and then we'll go back to the preparation. So actually, um, we at Bio back in mid-February um, sent out a message to our 800 biotech companies and asked, who of you are capable of getting involved in this, in this work? Who have the, the scientific expertise, mm -hmm. the, the development expertise, and or the manufacturing? And we began to coordinate and avoid duplicity, share data, share resources. So there's much more coordination going on than has ever been the case in any other disease. And that's a good thing. And we're that's doing news, it yeah. with uh, the federal government is involved. So um, we're kind of on that. We're trying to make sure that we're not, um, that we're all watching what each other is doing and not just duplicating. So that's, that's a good thing. Is that within U.S. or is that globally, right? Because there's all these partner studies, right? Oxford is working with other countries, right? Well, when, if a vaccine is found, right, we, we want, everyone wants it, not just one, right. one country. Right. So um, our organization has membership from 35 other countries besides the U.S. So we are um, uh, coordinating with those countries, those companies as well. Um, I'm not here to tell you that the, the entire globe is unified in one single <laughs> effort, but nor do I, do I think that's necessarily uh, needed. But back to your earlier question about preparation. Um, it, it, is, it is a sad thing to say that we knew um, five years ago that a pandemic was inevitable. It wasn't a question of whether this was going to happen. It was just a question of when. So we put out a report in October of 2015, and we said, here are the things you do need to do to prepare. Mm -hmm. The first of those was to say, the vice president should be in charge of planning planning ahead of time. So the vice president can work with the different cabinet officers that, uh, that, that are affected by this, or can contribute to this. Um, that didn't happen. So instead, what we wound up with is the vice president uh, in charge of the response, but it, it's too late. Another thing that we had recommended was that each urban area 
uh, have a, str a stratified system of hospitals. So you would say, let's take New York, let's take San Francisco, let's take San Francisco. You know, what should happen there is you say, which hospital in San Francisco would be the one hospital that you would want the first um, group of, of pandemic patients to go? And hospitals there agree upon that. And then that hospital would begin to, to stockpile ventilators, masks, gloves, all the kinds of, of drugs and medicines and equipment that you would need. And then work your way down to the next hospital, the yeah. next hospital. So everyone would pre be prepared and not panicking to how they, how they get the materials that they need. So it's a, it's a, it's a streamline of, of patients, right? So that, that you can coordinate all the resources that, that you need. Right. And, so and the, really so once training the, as well. Like you have trauma one hospitals for that reason, gunshot victims go to certain hospitals over other Right, hospitals. right. Same idea. And it's it's yeah. a very, it, it's a very similar, I created a trauma system in Pennsylvania when I was in the legislature. And that's exactly what you do. You go, this is the hospital you want your worst trauma patients to go to. And if that's full, then you go to the second one. And we should be doing that with the pandemic as and well. And how much are you seeing that happening? Well, it didn't happen at all. Um, it yeah. didn't happen at all in this case. But um, unfortunately, the, it's part of human nature that we tend to learn after the fact rather than before the fact. I think we'll be far ready for the next one. And the next one is inevitable. Yeah. Do you think that it is a, a sense of of people, I mean, you're in the business, right? So you are you are anticipating all of these things coming, and and certainly it is hard when people are talking about inevitabilities, whether you're talking about a pandemic or climate change or or things that you're trying to prepare for. I think in any kind of scenario, there's mm -hmm. there's some push pushback. Even in 2015, if everyone had done everything uh, you had recommended, those two main things that you're recommending, uh, uh, where would we be? Do, can you even imagine what would be differently? Because this yeah. this kind of came on very quickly, and we still did have this shortage of ventilators, and production can only happen so so fast. Yeah. Well, the bat still would have had the virus in China. The, the, the virus still would have been transmitted to humans. Um, we can do a better job in, in, in observing that earlier, but that happened. It, there was a breakout in, outbreak in China, and it spread to the U.S. Um, most of that um, uh, could not have been avoided. Let's say none of that could have been avoided. Um, but what could have been, if we had prepared as we should have, uh, there would be none of this business of we don't have enough ventilators, we're sharing ventilators, we're scrambling, our people don't have enough gear. None of that would have happened. We would have been completely prepared. We'd know exactly what kinds of things to do. So, and it's not that we expected the, the public to be um, thinking about this. It's far from their, their minds. But the, but the, but the governmental officials um, should have um, uh, been taking this more seriously because, you know, the, the, what we're up against always is, well, it's expensive. You know, if Medicare is yep. going to pay for all this equipment, well, how expensive has this been? Trillions of dollars in federal uh, appropriations already. We're just in the beginning of this, really. And, and what it's done to the economy is, is immeasurable. Yeah, it's terrible. And so let's be clear. I mean, if we're learning from history, right, we should be taking these lessons right now because this will become history at, at some point, you know, and, uh, and, and we don't want when the next one wraps around saying we didn't learn a thing from that horrible, right. and horrible the next pandemic we endured. Right. And the, the frequency of these events is likely to increase because one of the things that happens as humans um, intrude on, on habitat that's, that's, uh, that puts them closer and closer to all kinds of, of species of animals, um, the likelihood of transmission of viruses from animals, wild animals, to humans increases. And our ability to spread it. I mean, we can keep comparing this to the 1918 pandemic and think about the travel that we're doing there versus how easily we go from state to state and country to country these days and, and spread it so quickly. Yeah. In terms of, we mentioned your optimism over vaccines. When you're looking at that and you're looking at a timeline and everyone has talked about how this stuff takes time and it just that's just the way it's always been. They've also talked about how so many hurdles have been, you know, crossed in, in records amount of time and that has given people optimism. If we go back to the Oxford vaccine, which, you know, just as, as a example, that researcher saying maybe September and an 80% likelihood that she believes her vaccine will work. Uh, you know, I, I just saw a new study that's starting, you know, here saying, well, maybe by the fall we could have emergency supplies. It's a different vaccine. I mean, what do you think when you look at that? I, I look at it and I mean, I'm crossing fingers and toes hoping that everyone's, everyone's right, but that's not based on <laughs> science as much as it's based on, on hope. For you, based on science, 
when people ask you, so where are we looking? How are we looking? I mean, do you think treatment comes first? The vaccine comes first? All well, these clearly, clearly the, the, the therapeutics or the treatments will come first and we'll have them relatively soon. There's a drug called Rendisivir, uh, Gilead out in California mm -hmm. has that drug. And what it does is um, when, the, when the virus enters the body and goes into our cells, what it does is it breaks in and then it, it commandeers the, the, um, the production system in the cell to make uh, copies of itself. And what Rendesivir does is it puts molecules in that cell that look to the virus like the building blocks that it needs to replicate itself, but it's not. So it's sort of like putting uh, a wrench in the works. And that stops the, that stops the, um, the virus from replicating. So if, we, if that, in fact, is, is as good as, it, as it's looking to be so far, um, that would be an enormous benefit because then, as I said, when we do venture out and all of a sudden we have a fever or we get symptoms, we can take a drug like that and stop it from, uh, from running its course and ending, putting us in the hospital. That would be tremendous. If we well, get a vaccine in, in, in a year, that would be a record pace. Um, there's never been a virus that's, uh, that's succeeded against a corona. I mean, never been a vaccine that's, yeah. that's succeeded against corona. Um, but nor has there ever been this kind of massive global effort um, taking shots on goal. So certainly a uh -huh. lot of brilliant, brilliant people in the world. So you know, I'll, I'll put my money on them. You know, but Gilead, you mentioned Remdesivir, uh, just said today actually that COVID nineteen patients taking its drug had a speedier recovery than the people that took the placebo. Although we did have some conflicting reports, you know, about Remdesivir when he had a leak report and then it came out and said, no, 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 don't. Right. You know, everyone had all this ballooning hope. Do you see that? I mean, usually these kind of happen, I don't want to say in silence, but they happen much more quietly with not everyone watching every single step, every single study to, to make sure, you know, is there a problem with all of us, you know, hoping, you know, I, I just talked to a UCSF researcher who's studying a, a medicine for gout and saying that could stop the uh, cytokine storm or, or the other that causes all the, the other organ failure for COVID right. patients, you know, being patient is is difficult, but when you talk about something like remdesivir, and everyone now knows that that name, they wouldn't have known it, you know, three months ago. But you know, in order to keep people from stockpiling it, or false hope, or giving it the time it needs, so that we don't all take a drug that causes some other issues, or doesn't actually do what it's supposed to do. Well, I, I think it's actually a great thing that people are because there's, you know, unfortunately, it's because they're scared and they want to get back to work and so forth. But I think it's a terrific thing that people are paying attention to what's going on in the science to see what it's like, to what, what it takes, how hard it is to develop these therapeutics and these vaccines and understanding, you know, the world of bio biotechnology more than they ever have. But I think that's a good thing. But what most people have to do is don't stockpile, don't, um, don't take something because you heard somewhere on the internet that it's a good, there are some who's not a scientist, yeah. so maybe you should try it. Um, follow the science, follow the advice of the scientists and protect yourself and your loved ones. That's the most people can do. What is, what is scientifically and realistically, the percentage of all of this stuff that's being tried will be, I mean, we, we only need, we need some, a few great ones instead of all of them working, but a percentage when you're looking at studies and you're paying attention to how many studies there are going right, right now, what percentage of them in, if we look at, at kind of industry-wide actually, actually go through and, and are successful? So 90% of everything we do in biotechnology fails. And if you look at, the, at Alzheimer's, it's about 100%. So companies have spent billions and billions of dollars over years, and we still don't have a, a good treatment for, all, for Alzheimer's. So that will be the case here. 90% of everything we try to do will fail. But as I said, we have 300 projects going. So if 30 of them are successful on developing therapeutics and vaccines, we'll be in terrific shape. And you have 300 projects, and what percentage of that of the many other projects that are going on? Well, this is 300. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's really a, the, the, the global, global, global number. number. Um, and in, in terms of antibody tests and these, these virus tests, I mean, that's the other question, right? As we put them out and people want to get testing out, how reliable are they? Because some, you know, I've seen some numbers saying, you know, 75% positive, you know, in terms of knowing for sure how many people are, are infected and the antibody tests of how many people, you know, actually have antibodies that maybe they were asymptomatic. In, in the number of tests that rolled out so, so, so quickly, how reliable do you think those are? Yeah. So the fact of the matter is that um, right now we're finding that some of these, there are, there are some uh, tests that are putting out that are fake, that don't work. Mm -hmm. We have to sort our way through those. Um, but we will. 
Um, and one of the things that they're just looking at now is that maybe in order to, to increase the reliability, that we may have to do two successive tests. So you take one test and maybe that gives you a 75% uh, certainty of the outcome and you take a second test and that takes up to about 95%. So that may happen, but we're going to have to have massive ability uh, to do this testing so people can do it at home reliably because that's the only way we'll know who has had the virus and has cleared it and now hopefully they're immune. We don't know that for sure yet, but hopefully they're immune. They can neither get it anymore nor transmit it to anyone else. And that will be a huge help in getting us um, to the point where we can reliably and safely go back to our, our normal lives. So if they asked you, Jim, what's our timeline for, for getting back? I mean, you know, states are doing their individual timelines. The federal government is saying, you know, is giving guidelines about a timeline. What, what do you think in terms of when we'll see a semblance of, of life as we knew it? Yeah, I, I think, you know, what we did, I think, wisely was we just, most governors just shut everything down. Um, because it was, you know, you know, people were dying and we didn't know what to do. And now I think you're seeing careful examination of, well, you know, this industry can function. Um, uh, you can do construction work, for instance, if you keep your social distancing. There, there, are, there are places where it's more likely that people can avoid um, threatening each other with, with the virus if they're, if they're positive. Uh, I think we'll, we'll see that happen. Once we get a couple of good therapeutics out there, where the, the risk become of, of, of a fatal uh, outcome becomes significantly diminished, I think you're going to see uh, a, a much greater ability for people to get back to work knowing so they, get sick, that, they, they can get treatment. What is the earliest you think? And, and not to push you on that, but certainly, I mean, people are, you know, if you're looking at schools, they're looking at fall, there are certain markers. I mean, everyone I think has kind of said goodbye to summer on some level. Businesses would like to get back to work, but, um, you know, in terms of a treatment timeline based on, on their abilities to kind of develop and where things are in process. Yeah, I, I think it's possible that we'll, we'll have some treatments by summer. Uh, um, that'd and be great news. How effective they are and how many they are, um, that, could, that could be a real game changer. And in 2015, you had this national blueprint and it, it, it wasn't, it's fair to say it wasn't followed. Do you feel like now uh, you know, as far as legs to stand on to, would you put forth that same blueprint and say this, this, let's, let's lay it over the COVID-19 model that we now know of what happened and that, that things will change in terms of the government and states and how we all kind of look at this and, and, and mm -hmm. rebuild, uh, you know, a, another blueprint that will help us manage the next one better? Yeah, I, I think that's the case. I mean, when we were running up and up on the hill, I, I served in Congress for 12 years. And when we would go up there, we'd go to the White House and talk about this, and we would carry books around. This is what happened in, in uh, 19, you know, 18, and people would go, okay, that was 100 years ago, so I'm not going to get too excited about that. Maybe it'll be another 100 years. Um, now, when we go back next year uh, and say, okay, now we saw what happened to the, to the world's population and to the world's economy, <clears throat> now do you get it? Um, and I think they will. Well, and, and if they're not uh, listening, certainly the American public is listening because I don't think anyone wants a repeat Absolutely <laughs> of, what we're, of what we're going now. Well, Jim Greenwood, uh, excellent to talk to you. I appreciate it. It gives me some uh, perspective and I get hope, it gives people hope <laughs> if we're talking about the summer for treatment and talking about uh, you know, the collaboration that is happening around the globe that has to give us uh, some some sense that, that things will get better sooner than later. Well, we're fortunate to live in a country that leads the world in biotechnology. Something like 57% of all the new drugs every year are created here. So we're at least we're in the right place um, to get have some hope for the future. Yes, let, it, let us lead the charge <laughs> with the great minds that we have here. All right, Jim, thank you so much. Uh, I you appreciate do. your time. And of course, you can find more information and interviews on coronavirusnow.com.